<coughs> Excuse me. This morning we're going to read a rather extended uh, passage in Matthew chapter 5, beginning in verse 17. Matthew chapter 5, beginning in verse 17, and what we're going to see here is Jesus make a declaration regarding what, sadly, is a controversial matter in the church today, and that is whether or not the law of God still applies to us. And then he's going to go on after his declaration that it does, in fact, still stand to uh, bring out the meaning of the commandments uh, as over against what the Jewish leaders were actually teaching the people. In other words, Jesus is going to take a stand for the truth, in this case, the moral law of God. And he's going to tell us what exactly it means. And why is he going to tell us this? Because we need to know it, because it's for our well-being, because if we're going to honor and glorify God, this is what we need to understand, and this is what we need actually to do. Now, it's not comprehensive, but it certainly does deal with a good portion of the moral law of God. So let's begin in verse 17, and I'll read through the end of the chapter. <clears throat> Jesus says, do not think that I came to abolish the law or the prophets. I did not come to abolish, but to fulfill. For truly I say to you, until heaven and earth pass away, not the smallest letter or stroke shall pass from the law until all is accomplished. Whoever then annuls one of the least of these commandments and teaches others to do the same shall be called least in the kingdom of heaven. But whoever keeps and teaches them, he shall be called great in the kingdom of heaven. For I say to you that unless your righteousness surpasses that of the scribes and Pharisees, you will not enter the kingdom of heaven. You have heard that the ancients were told you shall not commit murder, and whoever commits murder shall be liable to the court. But I say to you that everyone who is angry with his brother shall be guilty before the court. And whoever says to his brother, you good for nothing, shall be guilty before the Supreme Court. And whoever says, you fool, shall be guilty enough to go into the fiery hell. Therefore, if you are presenting your offering at the altar, and there remember that your brother has something against you, Leave your offering there before the altar and go, first be reconciled to your brother, and then come and present your offering. Make friends quickly with your opponent at law while you're with him on the way, so, to, so that your opponent uh, may not hand you over to the judge, and the judge to the officer, and you be thrown into prison. Truly I say to you, you will not come out of there until you have paid up the last cent. You have heard that it was said, you shall not commit adultery. But I say to you that everyone who looks at a woman with lust for her has already committed adultery with her in his heart. If your right eye makes you stumble, tear it out and throw it from you. For it is better for you to lose one of the parts of your body than for your whole body to be thrown into hell. If your right hand makes you stumble, cut it off and throw it from you, for it is better for you to lose one of the parts of your body than for your whole body to go into hell. It was said, whoever sends his wife away, let him give her a certificate of divorce. But I say to you that everyone who divorces his wife, except for the reason of unchastity, makes her commit adultery. And whoever marries a divorced woman commits adultery. Again, you have heard that the ancients were told, you shall not make false vows, but shall fulfill your vows to the Lord. But I say to you, make no oath at all, either by heaven, for it is the throne of God, or by the earth, for it is the footstool of His feet, or by Jerusalem, for it is the city of the great King. Nor shall you make an oath by your head, for you cannot make one hair white or black. But let your statement be yes, yes, or no, no. Anything beyond these is of evil. You have heard that it was said, an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth. But I say to you, do not resist an evil person. But whoever slaps you on the right cheek, turn the other to him also. If anyone wants to sue you and take your shirt, let him have your coat also. Whoever forces you to go one mile, go with him too. Give to him who asks of you. And do not turn away from him who wants to borrow from you. 
You have heard that it was said, you shall love your neighbor and hate your enemy. But I say to you, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you so that you may be sons of your Father who is in heaven. For he causes his son to rise on the evil and the good and sends rain on the righteous and the unrighteous. For if you love those who love you, what reward do you have? Do not even the tax collectors do the same? If you greet only your brothers, what more are you doing than others? Do not even the Gentiles do the same? Therefore, you are to be perfect as your heavenly Father is perfect. Well, may the Lord bless His word to our hearing. Of course, Jesus said many things in here that we're not going to touch on except the general principle, truth is important and we need to take a stand for it. Now, as I've already mentioned in our passage, Jesus begins by laying down a basic fact. God's moral law has not changed. His standard is still the same as it's always been today as it was then. Jesus did not come to do away with the Old Testament, but rather He came to fulfill it. He came to fulfill the, the prophecies. He came to fulfill the promises so that He might become the Savior, that He might become your Savior. Now, the way that He did this was by fulfilling the law of God, and Jesus did do that. He fulfilled the ceremonial law by His sacrifice on the, Christ, uh, on the cross, which is the reason why uh, you and I don't bring animals to worship the Lord this morning. We don't have to sacrifice them. We don't have to offer them to God. And Jesus fulfilled the moral law through His personal obedience, which is why you no longer need to keep it in order to save yourself. Notice that distinction, to save yourself. Now, only His death can take away your sins once and for all. And only His perfect righteousness can provide you with the righteousness that alone God will accept. And that's why we believe Jesus is the only Savior, the only way to God. Now, I told you Jesus fulfilled the law in order to become our Savior, and yet Jesus tells you that you still need to keep the moral law. He came to free you from the curse of this law. He came by laying down His life and by fulfilling perfect righteousness. He came to free you from God's just judgment for your sins, but He did not come to free you from obedience to His law. Rather, He came to give you the power actually to keep it. He came to put His law in your minds and to write it upon your heart. That is what Jeremiah tells us, of course, the Lord tells us through Jeremiah, the author to the Hebrews tells us is the blessing of the new covenant. Not that the law is done away with, but rather God gives you the power to keep it. Not to free you from obedience, but to free you from disobedience. Well, after having said that, Jesus goes on to show us something else about the law, and that is its importance and His very high regard for it. Because after saying that the standard has not, in fact, changed, he then goes on to correct the ways that the teachers of Israel had changed it, that they had corrupted it. Uh, when Jesus says, for instance, you have, ter you have heard that the ancients were told, or you have heard that it was said, he wasn't really so much quoting Moses and the Scriptures, but he was quoting rabbinic tradition. He was repeating what their teachers had actually been teaching them. And when he says, but I say to you, he wasn't, as some people say, changing the law of God, as it were, transforming it from a law of wrath to a law of love. It's always been a law of love. He wasn't changing what Moses said. He wasn't changing what the Scripture said. He was simply correcting their tradition, telling them what the Scriptures really meant because the law had not changed. Now, again, as I mentioned before, this shouldn't surprise us that Jesus would do this because Jesus is the Word of God. It was His Spirit who inspired the writers of Scripture. If, if anyone was going to correct it, we would certainly expect Him to correct these mistakes. If anyone was going to stand up for the truth, we would expect Jesus to do it. Now, to my point this morning, 
is simply this. If you know Jesus Christ, and if you are becoming like Him, which is what it means to know Him, then you also will be changed in this way. You also will have a high regard for God's truth, and you will stand up for it, even as Jesus did. Now, let's consider three things on that particular subject. First of all, I think we all recognize not all of these divine truths are equally important. And when I say that, I have to be careful because it is all importance, right? But what I mean is with regard to your salvation, certain truths don't really, they're not really central to the gospel. They're more peripheral. They're still important. So they're not all equally important. But even though that's true, secondly, all of them are important, okay? But finally, since they all are important, that you should be willing to stand up for all of them as Jesus did. Again, not only to stand up, but to do it as Jesus did, okay? So first of all, let's consider that not all truths are equally important, at least with regard to salvation. Um, they're all important, of course, as I've said, but, and so they should all be important to you, but they're not all of the same weight when it comes to salvation. For instance, if I were to ask you which is more central to the Christian faith, who God is, that He is one God who exists eternally in three persons, or when Jesus is coming again, before or after the millennium, okay? Or if I were to ask you, how are you justified before God? How are you actually saved? Are you saved, I mean, by grace through faith alone? Or what form of church government is really biblical? Is it the independents? Is it the Presbyterians? Is it the Episcopal? You know, well, what would you say? Which of these are really more important? Well, I, I think you already know, don't you? because you can see immediately that the doctrine or the teaching of the Bible on the nature of God, <clears throat> the Trinity, and salvation by grace through faith alone. These are far more important than when Jesus is coming again or what form of church government we are actually observing. Everything that the Lord tells you about salvation is more important, at least to you personally, because if you get these things wrong, or, of course, if you know them and you don't respond to them as you should, you are not going to see heaven. By the way, obedience, as we've already seen, is also very important, okay? You're not saved by your obedience, but it is evidence. Now, realizing that there are foundational, fundamental truths that are more important than the other truths, I just want to tell you briefly what those truths are so you're not left in the dark because these foundational truths... These, what we call the fundamentals of the gospel, are how we distinguish who is saved and who is not saved, who is a Christian brother or sister, or who is in need of being evangelized. So you can see these, these are very important. Plus, these are the truths you need to believe in order to be saved. So what are those truths? Well, first of all, that the Bible is God's infallible word, the only source of information regarding God and His way of salvation. That alone is the book. You realize that the way, one of the reasons why we differ from so many other religions is because they have other books. Secondly, that there is only one God who exists eternally in three persons, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, the doctrine of the Trinity. If you get that wrong, you have the wrong God. That Jesus Christ is the Son of God, that He is fully God. And that he became a man, fully man, by being conceived and born of a virgin. That he lived a perfect life. That he died on the cross for sin. That he rose again the third day and ascended into heaven. Okay, that is central. If you get the wrong Jesus, you miss heaven. Fourthly, that salvation is by God's grace alone through faith alone. We believe it's by faith alone because otherwise, if you mix man's works into it, it's no longer by grace alone. So it's by grace alone, and so that it might be by grace alone, it is received by faith alone. And for that faith to be genuine faith, it must be accompanied by repentance. 
So we believe in, in you know, salvation by grace through faith alone, a faith that is not alone, a faith that is accompanied by repentance. And then finally, it is essential that you believe that Jesus is coming again to raise the dead, to gather the living, to judge all mankind, okay? So these are the things that are central to the Christian faith. It's not really that complicated. I mean, you don't have to know a book of theology. You don't have to know everything that the Bible teaches. These are the essential things, and, and sometimes the Lord even saves without a person even knowing all of these things, but He brings them to this understanding very quickly because these things are foundational to the Christian faith. And this is how we weed out, okay, who's saved and who isn't saved. So these are the most important. Now, secondly, since these are the only teachings that are necessary for your salvation, does that mean the others aren't important? Well, of course not. I mean, they are important. All of God's truths are important. Now we need to get to those truths. Why are they important as well? I mean, why can't we just say, it doesn't matter what anybody believes. As long as you get these right, it's a free-for-all, everything else. Now, it, it isn't because everything, everything he says is important. And it's important for at least two reasons. First of all, God's glory. And secondly, your well-being. And of course, if it's good for your well-being, it's also good for others. So God's glory and man's well-being. For example, you'll notice that this definition of, of what a Christian is and the, and the fundamentals of the faith did not include God's absolute sovereignty in salvation. The, the issue that divides Calvinists and Arminians, okay? What difference does it make whether you believe you had the ability to receive Jesus Christ apart from God's grace, as the Arminians believe, or whether you believe God had first to make you alive and to raise you from the dead and to give you that ability to believe before you could trust Jesus, as Calvinists believe, what difference does it make as long as you both believe that you're saved by grace through faith alone by trusting in Jesus Christ? What difference does it make? Well, it still makes a difference, even though both can be saved. There is the matter of what the Bible actually teaches. That's important, right? Because it's only one way or the other. It's not both. But there is also the matter of God's glory, okay? Because one of these positions takes away from God's glory, whereas the other one gives Him full glory. So let me ask you the question, which one gives Him greater glory? Uh, that you trusted Jesus when He was offered to you because you had a spark of goodness left in you from the fall, or that God had to raise you from the dead. He had to overcome your sinful heart. He had to have mercy on you before you could actually trust Jesus Christ and be saved. Well, I would submit to you the second one gives God greater glory because the more God does, in salvation, the more glory he gets. And what he tells us is he has done it all. And he hasn't really left anything up to you, so he gets all the glory. Now, I've told you many times that Augustus Toplady was angry with John Wesley over this particular issue. And he, I don't believe he was angry with Wesley merely because Wesley disagreed with him on what the Bible actually taught. He was angry with Wesley because what Wesley believed and what he taught robbed God of his glory. God deserves the credit for that, Wesley, not man. It wasn't man's ultimate choice, it was God's ultimate choice. And the sinner who was saved owes everything to him. You're taking away from God's glory. So when you vary from the truth, you can affect how much credit God gets, how much glory he gets, how much honor he gets. Well, what about the other truths? You know, how is it that they're important for your well-being? Because that's also another issue at stake. Well, remember that anything that we happen to get wrong regarding what the Bible actually teaches is going to hurt us in some way. It's going to steer us in the wrong direction, okay? For example, it's true that your view of when Jesus is coming doesn't bear directly on your salvation, but does that mean it's unimportant? If you believe the second coming is near, if you can believe it's going to basically happen any time, 
that's going to, you know, do, it's going to influence you to make certain decisions. You're going to choose certain paths. If you believe it's far away, then you're going to choose other paths. Let me just give you a, a personal example. I may have used this once before. But in my earlier days as a believer, I was in a church that taught that Jesus Christ could come any time. I mean, he could have come any time from the time he ascended. Uh, the belief is that even his disciples were, were looking for him to come in the second coming even during their lifetime. Well, 2,000 years went by, but at the particular time frame in which I lived and the, the particular church I was in, there was the belief that Jesus could come at any moment. Now, let me just give you the scenario. I, I um, okay, Israel reestablished itself as a nation in 1948. Uh, there's a passage of Scripture that says that this generation will not pass away until all these things come about, and the belief was that a generation is 40 years. So Jesus is coming in 1988. Well, then you need to back up seven years for the tribulation, which means that the church is going to be raptured in 1981. Well, I graduated high school in 1976. I'm only five years away from Jesus is coming. And so what should I do? Spend four of those five years in college preparing for something that's not going to take place? Should I seek to get married and have children even though I only have perhaps a couple of years in which to raise them? Can you see how your belief is going to influence the way you live? I mean, are you living for the short, the short term, as it were? Or are you looking at the long haul? Uh, what you believe is going to influence that. What you believe regarding anything the Bible teaches is going to affect your life in some way. Why did Jesus labor what He did in the Sermon on the Mount regarding what Israel was being taught if it didn't make any difference? You have heard it said, but I say to you. And the reason He was saying that is because His leaders taught them something that was wrong, that was leading them astray, and it was hurting them. And so Jesus brought the law back up to where it was so they would know what the standard was so that they would stay far away from that which could ultimately destroy them. If you misunderstand God's truth, it not only will cause you to dishonor God in some way, but in doing so, you're also going to hurt yourself and you're going to likely hurt other people that you lead to believe the same way that you do. So all of His truth is important, even if it's not essential to salvation, all of it is important for His glory, for your well-being, and for the well-being of others. Now finally, since there are truths that are essential for salvation, and since all truth is essential for God's glory and your well-being and the well-being of others, what should you do? Well, you should, as Jesus, be willing to stand up for His truth. Now, first, you want to make sure that you get it right. You want to make sure that you know the truth, that you believe the truth, and that you're embracing that which is most essential, that you're embracing the gospel, that you believe those five foundational things, that you're really trusting Jesus Christ and turning from your sins. I mean, that's the only way you're going to be able to fulfill the greatest commandment which is to love the Lord your God with all your heart, mind, soul, and strength. You need the transformation of heart that only the gospel can bring. But secondly, you'll want to make sure that you get it right so that you can be a source of salvation to others and a source of encouragement to those who know it but maybe are getting certain things wrong. The second greatest commandment is you are to love your neighbor as yourself. So let's talk about some what-ifs, okay? What should you do if you come across someone who doesn't believe something that is foundational to the Christian faith, such as the Mormon who believes that there are innumerable gods, or the Mormon who aspires to become a god himself? Uh, what should you do when you encounter a Jehovah's Witness who believes that Jesus is a creature and He is not God? and who aspires to enter into heaven or perhaps paradise on earth through their works? What happens when you encounter an atheist who denies the existence of God or you run into the average person who believes they're going to heaven 
but who bases their hope purely on the fact that their good works are going to outweigh their bad works in the end when God finally puts them on trial. You know, what should you do? Well, you need to do what Jesus would do, right? You need to love them enough to tell them the truth. I mean, don't forget the fact that you and I were once ignorant without the gospel and without God. We had no hope. We were on our way to hell, but somebody was willing to tell us the truth and tell us what we needed to know in order to be saved. You need to evangelize them. You need to try to correct their errors. You need to try to communicate those foundational truths. That's what Jesus did when He went throughout Israel preaching the gospel. And of course, you need to do it out of love. Don't come down on them, you know. You believe what and poof, you know. And you need to be gentle. You need to be loving. You need to be encouraging. You need to show genuine concern. And you need to keep doing that and sharing the truth with them until they either trust Jesus Christ or they become hostile to the truth. When that happens, Jesus says, do not cast pearls before swine. Now, God has entrusted you with a great treasure. It's the only message that He uses to save others. And He tasks you with this responsibility. You need to give it away to as many people as you possibly can. So what should you do with this truth? Well, when you run into people who disagree with those foundational things, you need to be willing to stand up for God's truth and evangelize them. As a matter of fact, I, I would, if, if you really want to do that, which you should, if Christ is being formed in you, pray that God would give you opportunities. I mean, unless we, we, it's like, you know, like Jesus said in the parable of the seed sower, we have this seed of the gospel in a bag. God has given it to us. And we can either keep it in the bag and walk with it wherever we go, or we can open the bag up and cast some of that seed uh, when we run into the to soil that will actually be able to, or at least theoretically or you know, potentially be able to receive that seed. We need to share it because if the seed stays in the pouch, nobody's going to be saved. The kingdom of heaven isn't going to advance. Christ is not going to be able to gather together His people. So pray that God would give you such a heart to do that. Pray that He would make you willing to stand up for the truth. Pray for opportunities to be able to do that. If you pray and ask for those opportunities and you really want those opportunities, God is going to give you those opportunities. So be ready for them when they come. Now, what should you do when you come across a brother or sister in Christ who believes the fundamentals of the Christian faith? but also believes things that rob God of His glory and are going to hurt them and others in some way because they believe something that isn't true. I mean, for instance, like the Arminian who believes that he chose God under his own power and his own strength. It was his choice. He did it on his own. And so he doesn't give God full credit for that salvation. And who also believes, by the way, that all men can choose Christ in their own strength. And so he doesn't rely on the work of the Holy Spirit when he goes out to evangelize, as he should. What do you do? Or with the antinomian. Again, fancy word, which means I'm against the law. I already told you there's a lot of people who believe that. Law of God, irrelevant. Law of love, that's it. They believe obedience is optional. What do you do when you come across somebody like that who uses that belief as an excuse not to obey and tells other people that they can go to heaven without obeying either? What, what should you do? Well, first of all, if they believe the gospel, if they're trusting Jesus Christ, if they're turning from their sins, I mean, if they're not actually living the antinomian life, even though they might express it that way, but are actually living for His glory, then you should embrace them as, as believers, as brothers and sisters in the Lord Jesus Christ and not just write them off because they happen to disagree with you or get angry with them and, and attack them, you know, with, with the truth, okay? You should embrace them. Secondly, you should try to convince them of the truth. But when you do it, 
Don't get into a, you know, yes it is, no it isn't, yes it is, no it isn't argument. Open the Bible, look at the Scriptures, and wrestle with the Scriptures together. They're not going to believe it unless they see it in Scripture, so you have to show it to them from the book and not just tell them that that's what you believe personally. Okay, so show them what God says in His Word, but thirdly, make sure you do it with a great deal of patience and love. Now, why do I say that? <laughs> you know, you've, you've heard it said and perhaps you've experienced it yourself that there are two hot-button issues for virtually everybody in the world. It, it has to do with politics and it has to do with religion. And those are the two things you might hear somebody have said or perhaps you've experienced it yourself. Those are two things you should never talk about because people have very strong opinions on politics and religion, and particularly religion. I mean, just look at the world around you. But Jesus shows you through His own examples that you do need to talk about religion, okay? You do need to talk about His truth. If you don't talk about it, nobody's going to be saved. If you don't talk about it, your brothers and sisters in Christ are not going to be able to honor God as they should, and they're going to get hurt, and they're going to hurt other people. Jesus shows you by His example that you need to love God enough and be concerned enough about others to take a stand for His truth. That's, that's the whole point. You need to take a stand for His truth, but you have to do it in such a way that, that you don't violate it in taking a stand for it, that you don't violate the law of love. Remember, all the commandments can be reduced to love. Love for God and love for your neighbor. God doesn't want you to beat your neighbor over the head with the truth. He doesn't want you to beat your brothers and sisters in Christ over the head with the truth. He wants you to share it in love and show them from the Scriptures and pray for them that they might see it. By the way, again, we all have varying beliefs. We need to pray at the same time that if we're wrong, that the Lord would also show us through other brothers and sisters and that we wouldn't just react in anger if somebody happens again to confront us and we're put on the spot and we have to defend our beliefs. We should not really believe anything regarding who God is or what He would have us to do unless we see it in here. This is, and I'm pointing to the Bible, th this, is th this is the grounds, okay? This is the book. This is the source of authority. It has to come from Scripture. So we need to know that it does. They need to know that it does. We all need the truth. Now, that's what Jesus did, as I said. He stood up for the truth. He preached it. He shared it. He communicated it because He knew it was necessary for salvation. It was necessary to glorify God. It was necessary for their, well, their well-being. And if you know Jesus... That's what you will do as well. So pray again along these lines that as you're praying that God would form Christ in you, pray that He would form this particular aspect of, of Jesus in you, that you would be one who knows the truth, embraces the truth, and is willing to share it with others. Well, let's, uh, let's bow for a moment of prayer and let's ask the Lord to help us do that.